How did you do it? How did you stay married for so, so long? How did you stay in love for so long? This essentially was the question posed by ABC News to four different couples uh, who had each been married for at least 50 years. And the question was, how did they stick together? What was the advice they had followed or what was the secret they had found to keep it together for that long? And so for the first couple interviewed, you had Sammy and Macy Waller. They had been married for, oh, a mere 75 years. When asked what was their secret, Macy said, I don't really know if there are any secrets. And then we're all like, oh, bummer. (laughs) That's why we were interviewing you. She goes on, we just respect each other and love each other. We're best friends. Isn't that precious? And Sammy, the husband, we don't do a lot of arguing. Uh, We try to get along most of the time, and we got along pretty good. We hung together, and then he adds, and I'm still hanging. So there you go. Then they ask Frank and Thelma Hoffman, who had been married, oh, just for 67 years at the time of the article, what was their secret? Thelma said, loving one another and a lot of patience. Frank adds, love and a wonderful companionship. That's the great secret. The other two couples interviewed, uh, they talked about the importance of communication, as you might uh, expect. They talked about respect, and they also talked about a sense of humor. Yes, that'll go a long way in keeping you together. Don't take yourself too seriously. I think we can all hear that. These were the secrets that held them together. Between these four couples interviewed in this article, they had been married 75 years, 67 years, 63 years, and the last one, you know, just a mere 51 years, respectively. But it stands in stark contrast, doesn't it, to the trends still going on in our society regarding marriage, where 50% of people's first marriages end in a breakup, while folks, if they get married a second or third time, it's even more divisive, more breakups than that. I suppose we as a society, we could really do well to heed the advice of the Wallers and the Hoffmans who had been married so long. But of course, it's not just marriages that end up splitting up, uh, but churches too. And it seems that churches are infamous, notorious for this. That's why we have a thing, an expression, church splits. They seem to happen all the time. I mean, there's a reason why you have, you know, as you even go down in these older towns that are here in Virginia, you got First Baptist Church, and then you got Second Baptist Church, like across the street. And I don't think all of them are plants out of the other one. They were We divide. But in view of Christ's call to us, remember the high priestly prayer from John 17? He called us to be one, to be united. And so these kind of divisions ought not to be. But evidently, staying together is pretty hard. It's not easy. Like in marriage, it can be hard. And so what's the counsel? What's the advice that will protect us and so unify the church and keep us together. And this is the issue, of course, we've been talking about Paul's dealing with in Corinth. They've got these divisions rising up among them. This is a church splintering over their theology, over a certain teacher or preacher. And God's answer to keep us together, to mend the fissures that are there, and that can be lurking too. I guess this is part of it. Like we might look at grace right now and we're like, oh, praise God, we're really unified And that is a praise, but I think any reason for division, they can easily just be lurking under the surface. But how do we stay together? It's because we keep the focus, and that's where Paul's at with us. He gives us the solution in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31, our study today. How does the church stick together? We boast in Christ together. That's the answer. The church that stays together is the church that boasts in Christ together and to Him alone. This is what will hold us as a church united because everything else, like we use that analogy of the solar system, you put something else in the middle, like you put the earth in the middle of our solar system, things get all out of whack. But you've put Christ and the cross right at the center, everything else remains in its proper orbit, holds in perfect harmony. And so that's what we need to be. We need to be a church that is just laser focused on Jesus Christ and what the cross has done. And we will then be a united church. A church that stays together must have been and is a church that boasts in Christ alone together. And we'll see two reasons that unfold in this text about why that is. And the first is this. The church must boast in Christ 
they're going to keep unified because you got to understand, in the gospel, God strips us of any reason, any and every reason to boast in ourselves. He takes them all away. The gospel exposes us. We talked about this last time. And in that way, humiliates us. It humbles us. And it's this realization that can help keep the church together. Because would you be surprised to hear that a common reason that churches split or that churches fight, the common reason or common denominator so often is just pride. Does that surprise you to hear that? When there's this overestimation of our own ideas, we have this high view of ourselves or our importance or the things we love, those must be most important to everybody else. And are you surprised when you lean into those things, it starts to fracture and push people away. It starts to create divisions in the church. And so in response, God's saying, no, 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 no. the gospel works differently. I'm going to save you by humbling you, giving you all reason to distrust yourself and know that you don't bring anything of value in that way to the table of yourself. And that's knowing that is how the church sticks together. Because again, as soon as Christians get a vaulted, a vaulted view of themselves, oh, I have special insights, special concerns, a special ministry, a, a favorite author and preacher everybody needs to listen to, again, divisions and factions are not far behind, and that's just, that's just a church split waiting to happen. But thankfully, again, God's given us a way to combat these kind of fractures and fracturing. And it begins with just this opening command in the text, consider your calling, brothers. Consider your calling. You need to stop and think about your salvation. Like, look at it, think about it, and the way God's done it. Because what you're going to see, it's a humbling salvation, if you don't get that already. Because we saw this last week, speaking about the wisdom of the cross. The message God gives to save us, it's a humbling message. It's one that cuts you down at your knees. It's one that shows you you're not wise of yourself. When you come to Christ and you're going to come and be forgiven, you're saying, I'm a sinner. I have failed you, God. I need mercy. That means you've got to come humbly. There's no other way to come to God. And that looks like even being humble in the way you think right? We talked about this. You're going to have to embrace God's folly over all of your supposed wisdom if you're going to be a Christian. Look at verse 21 of this chapter, just to reset the context a bit. 1 Corinthians 1.21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. This was God's plan. This was God's wise plan that he would make sure the world would not come to know God by its own wisdom, own approach, own way of thinking. He goes on, furthermore, it pleased God. I love that. God delighted in this. It gave him a smile to think about it. What? That through the folly of what we preach, the cross, to save those who believe. It delighted God with the idea. He put something before man that man would go, that looks lame. And he says, oh, but this is how I will save your soul. We get this. Salvation at the cross leaves no room for big heads or puffed out chests. But what we see, and we saw this, it's not just the message of the cross that humbles, but then when you start to look at whom the cross saves, we're a humble lot. It's a humble bunch of people. And I don't mean that we have, that we are all meek. I just mean that more in the case here, we are more like losers. Generally speaking, the church is not made up of the A list of the world's rich and famous and influential. It's a humble group. And that's Paul's next point here. This is the mastery wisdom of God. He not only saves by a message that the world thinks is foolish, God intends to mainly save only the fools of the world, the despised, those whom the world overlook and pay no attention to. That's what he's getting at now to get to at verse 26. Consider your calling. 
For consider your calling, brothers, verse 26, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. He's telling the Corinthian church, just stop for a second. Take stock of yourselves. Look around. We're not impressive. We don't represent the the movers and shakers of society. No offense, but we're not the most beautiful bunch. And you're going to find that's by design. You got to understand the world's just not impressed with Christians. And that's true from the very beginning. Of course, they weren't impressed with our Christ. But even in the early church, we have this. This is a man named Celsus. He's from the AD 100s. So this is very early on in the church. And he was an ardent critic and scoffers of the fools that call themselves Christians. He said this. He disdainfully rehearsed this. He said, the Christian's rules are like this. The rules that we follow, the things that we say, our instruction as Christians, it's like this. He said, this is what the Christians say. Let no one educated, no one wise, no one sensible draw near. For these abilities are thought by us Christians to be evils. But for anyone who's ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone who's a child, let him boldly come to us. And then he comments, by the fact that they Christians admit that these people are the only ones worthy of their God. They show that they want and are able to convince only the foolish, dishonorable, and stupid, only slaves, women, and children. And guess what? The view of the world toward Christianity hasn't changed much. Go down to VCU, talk to a budding biologist down there, and tell them that you think God made the world in six 24-hour days and see what they tell you. Or talk to a philosophy student and tell him, yeah, I I think we should live by the morals that are in this 2,000-year-old book. And guess what they're going to say? You're a fool, is what they'll tell you. You're not too wise. The world's not impressed. And a part of that is by design. Because here's the real wild thing about all of this. In verse 26, that the church is made up of the not worldly wise, the the not strong, the weak. Why is the church made up like this? It was on purpose. God designed the church to be comprised of the fools, the dunces, the weak of mind, the slow-witted, and the disenfranchised. And God's not embarrassed by that. It's not a liability to him. To him, it's a feature And so he's saying, Corinthians, before you stop trying to, you know, who's the smartest, who's the best teacher, who's the wisest and has all the insight, he's saying, slow down, look at yourselves. Stop fooling yourself. Verse 26, consider your calling, brothers. Now, what's he getting at with calling here? What's Paul talking about? This calling is whom God has chosen to be his, who he has picked, and then he has called them. And not just invited them. There's a gospel call, yes, we've talked about this, that goes out to everybody. But there's a kind of call where God then also draws, and irresistibly, that they would come to know him. This is what we call new birth. This is regeneration. This is the work of faith that God calls and works in the heart. And to prove this point, that this is what he means, just look back up to verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 1. This is the last time he mentioned called or calling. And he said this. This is a contrast, right? But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Again, that's a contrast, right, to the world. The Jews and the Greeks, they look at the cross, what do they see? They see folly. They see a stumbling block. They see something they don't want. But we, the called, we've come to see something. We see the cross, and what do we see? We see the very power of God and the wisdom of God at work to save our souls. But what accounts for the difference? Why is it that most of the world looks at the cross and sees folly, and a few of us, we see the wisdom of God? Why is it that most Jews, most Greeks, Most Americans, most Richmonders, they look at the cross and they see folly, 
But those of us who are in Christ, we see God's mighty work to save. What's the difference? Is it because we're so much smarter and, you know, spiritually insightful? No, that's not it. Is it because, well, I just think harder and I'm generally wiser than most people. That's why I figured the cross out. If you know me, you know that ain't the answer. Well, what is it then? Because some are called. Because God has changed some of our hearts. He's taken the blinders off so we can see the truth of the gospel. Because God has chosen to overwhelm our spiritually blind and foolish and dead hearts. And what does he do? He breathes in life. He causes us to be born again. Jesus talks about, of course, John 3. I don't think I can beat Paul's description of what happens here in our hearts when he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Now, what is that? He's talking about Genesis chapter 1. When God created out of nothing, he spoke and light was there. And he's saying, that's the same God who does this. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, what has he done? He has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, but where? But in the face of Jesus Christ. Earlier in that passage, he's like, the blinders have come off. If our gospel's veiled, it's not because it's not glorious. It's veiled because the, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. But then the God of heaven can regenerate the heart and give us eyes to see. Or this is what Jesus talks about in John chapter 6. Right? You know this text from John 6, 44. Jesus says, no one can come to me. That is, come to faith. Come to salvation. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me does what? Draws him. That word draws doesn't always just mean like, come here. You know, like the Reese's Pieces or whatever that that E.T.'s following to go somewhere. That's not how this drawing works. This word can mean drag. He is seizing you and taking you to himself. What's the point? When the Father chooses you, when he calls you, when he starts drawing you, you're going to come, even if you come dragged. Another way to say this, and this is back to chapter 1 here, if he chose you to be his, you will be. Because notice, as he explains more of this calling, this is the synonym he keeps tying to it. God's choosing of you, his election of you. Look at verse 26 again and keep reading. For consider your calling, brothers. What kind of calling are we talking about? Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. And so why is it then that most who come to faith are, were not the sharpest knives in the drawer? Verse 27, but God... But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that think there's something that are. God chose what is foolish. God chose what is weak. God chose what is low. He chose what is despised. He chose the things, he chose the nothings. Because you know what? Nothings can't take credit for anything. But get this. When God chooses, he then calls. And when he calls the elect, oh, they come. But notice, who's the actor in this? Who's the initiator? God. God chose. God chose. God called. God justifies, God draws, God chose, God, God, God. And again, that means ultimately, not you. You see, the gospel, isn't it? It's a humbling work that humiliates us. Because here's the thing, we know this elsewhere in Scripture, you wouldn't come if you wanted to, because you would never want to. God overcomes your hard heart. You didn't first chose God, he chose you. And wh- why is he talking about this? Because that means he gets all the credit. 
He is the reason of your salvation. And this means you cannot brag about anything of yourself. It cuts us off in the knees. Just back to it then, as we keep going in chapter 1. If God does all the choosing, you know, he's sovereign over this, we'd say. He does all the calling. He does all the drawing. So, so he's making up the church exactly how he wants, you see. So he gets all the credit or the blame. And the world looks at it, and they're like, there's a lot to blame here. This is who you could draw into your church? Again, look at it. The, church, or the, the world's not impressed. Verse 26, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But that was on purpose. God intentionally chooses the rejects, the losers, the overlooked. He chooses, right, the misfit toys that nobody wants. He says, I'll take those. Why? Because again, it humbles us. We got no claim about why we're here. And then two, it humbles the world for all of their supposed wisdom. Because we see it again, just so expressly, looking back at verses 27 and 28. And it follows each time he talks about why he chose. Notice why God chose those that he chose. Because he had a purpose in it. Why did he choose the not so desirable? Let's see it again. Verse 27. But God chose what is foolish in the world to what? To shame the wise. He chose what is low and despised in the world. Or excuse me. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Verse 28 now. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to do what? To bring to nothing the things that are. He chose the rejects, the undesirables. He chose the deplorables, but just to shame all the world and all of their pride and all of their brains and their smarts and their attainments. To shame them. Especially at the day of judgment. When the world's folly, all of their supposed wisdom, will be exposed for all that it is. All the brilliant PhDs, they're going to look on in the day of judgment. They're going to be dumbfounded as all of these slow-witted Christians shuffle into heaven. All the strong, the super athletic, and the popular are going to look on and see those who were never invited to the world's parties coming in ushered to the feast of the Lamb. The world and all of their strength, all of their wisdom, all of their pride are going to look on in shame and finally realize that though when it's too late, all of their wisdom and riches and strength meant nothing. It did nothing to save our souls, to make us truly wise. He boils it down into verse 29. Why did God choose the overlooked of the world? Why does he choose the low? Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. There it is. No sinner, which all of us are here, let alone on the planet. No sinner has any claim, any right, any reason to boast before God. And if you think you do, then you are proud and you have yet to see the wisdom of the cross. And so it is. If in God's mercy, then, you are loved by God in that final day, and you are entering into his heaven, understand, it's not because you were so smart, or you were so wise, or so good, or spiritually sincere, or so kind. The only reason you're going there is because he chose you. The only reason you're going there is because then he called you. The only reason you're going in is because he wanted you to be there. And then we're like, well, Why? Why you, if you're a believer, why you instead of your unbelieving neighbor or that hard-hearted sibling that has the same parents? Why are you going in they don't seem to be? Why did God love you? Well, because he set his love on you in Christ. Well, why did he set his love on me? But because he chose to love you. But why? Well, really, it has nothing to do with you that you can boast or brag about it. Actually, we look at this text Seems like most of us were chosen because of what we weren't. Verse 
In that way, we say his choosing of you, though, really was entirely unconditional. It was based on no condition in you toward the positive. But it's just sheer sovereign mercy from God. And get this too, just as an aside. If his condition to show you mercy rests only just in him, that it had nothing to do with you, what makes us think then that when we have done something, messed up, met some condition, that his love has stopped? It didn't rest on you then. Why does it now? It doesn't. It rests on Christ. And just besides, what have we learned about this? If we've come to even that apprehension, let alone, if we, we've come to any great spiritual insight, where does that come from? Again, is it because we're better Bible students than other Christians? Is it because, well, we know Greek and Hebrew? Mm -hmm. No, it comes to us as a gift, doesn't it? It's a grace. And if that's the case, then how come I can, how can I put down, insult, or chide even other brothers in the church because they don't get it yet? Because what did you do to get it? And when we're doing those things, what are we doing? But we're being factious, aren't we? Divisive. Dividing the church into the reformed and the not so reformed, I guess. Or the church into the big God theology, and then we're insinuating what? Yeah, everybody wants a small God theology? Or that we're the really insightful Bible students, and, you know, they're just kind of more cursory reading, thoughtless, probably Arminians. I mean, is that what we're trying to say about our brothers and sisters? And of course, you understand, it doesn't have to be a theological position. It doesn't have to be, it can be just a, it can be some ministry model. It can be some book, some class, some, some author even. Our own church, this was years and years ago, became nearly divided over a certain parenting approach called Growing Kids God's Way. Now, maybe the title didn't help, but anyway, I'll get to that. I can't comment on the teaching of the series itself. I never read it. I have my concerns, but the trouble really was this. People in the congregation, they took the author's advice, but they took it as gospel, such that when you were also parenting your kids not by, not the book, but that book, they thought you were sinning. And can you imagine that might, might lead to division? Even good counsel, a good teacher... If he gets exalted or given any kind of real status, division is just ready to take place. Or, and maybe that's not your jam. You know, you're not like the, the theological egghead or like into all the latest, you know, church trends. But it's still easy to divide and maybe just over the kind of same things the world divides over. You know, we're called out from the world as the church and yet we can still all come together and then just divide into our separate groups. And if we do that unthinkingly, we do it just on the same basis the world does. Which would look like what? Common interests? Oh, they're in the same profession. I like to go hang out with them at church. Oh, oh, they have the same standard of living as I do. That's who I really want to be around. Oh, they're in the same life stage. That's who I really want to spend my time with. They have the same hobbies I do. And you know what? It might not even be intentional, but that can be pride and division too. Because you're refraining from fellowship from most of the church, or simply ignoring many of the church, because they're just not like you. And you know what happens when we do that? What have we done? We're just like the world. That's what the world does all the time. When Christ is saying to all that he has called and chosen for himself, to embrace all that he has called and chosen, even if they're not like you, which means, guess what? You might need to humble yourself. But when we do that, and we see it taking place here, part of this is let us excel still more at this. But when we do that, the world's going to look on and see something they don't understand. 
They're going to see a unity. They're going to see a common denominator here that they don't get. And that's the wisdom of God in the church. But to get there, you got to first see the Lord stripping us of any reason to boast in ourselves. But that doesn't mean that all boasting is put aside. It's just redirected. Because we see that God supplies us with every reason to boast in Jesus Christ. And this is what holds us as the church together. How does a church stay together? It's not a church that because we don't boast about anything, but we boast singularly in one thing, Jesus Christ and his cross. And it begins here, back to the text, that is, we have nothing, we are nothing, Christ is everything, and that's why we boast in him. Look at verse 30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Again, you had nothing, but what do you get in Christ? He became to us wisdom from God. He became righteousness from God, sanctification from God, redemption from God. What more do we need if you got Jesus Christ? In the first place, he says, when God has put you in Christ Jesus, you know, he's united you to Jesus in God's mind. You have such a close relationship with him. When God, the Father, looks at you, he sees his son. When that's happened by faith, what's the first thing you really receive? He lists here. And actually, it's the summary term about all of it. Paul calls it wisdom. Again, it's the great reverse. The, the, the world says there is no wisdom in Christianity. And God's saying, no, the first thing you get in Christ is real wisdom. But what kind of wisdom is he talking about here? Because it's not necessarily a wisdom how to get ahead in life. That is, in an earthly life. The wisdom and the insight he's talking about is the wisdom of the cross. This is the wisdom he gives. That we would see the glory of the cross. To make the point, again, I just point you back to verse 24 in this first chapter. Remember, the, the world looks at the same thing we're looking at. They look at the gospel. They look at the cross. And what do they see? They, they see folly. They see weakness. But what do we see? Verse 24, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and wisdom of God. That's what we see. Or look over to chapter 2, verse 6. You know, maybe the next page or something like that. 1 Corinthians 2, 6. Paul says, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. So, We do give wisdom, but it's God's wisdom. He notes, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, it's a different kind of wisdom. And and what is the wisdom that he sets forth? Jump your eyes up to verse 2 of chapter 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what's the point? The world just doesn't get it. We give forth its real wisdom, but the world just can't see it. They didn't know what the cross was about. And so as it goes on, they couldn't see it, so they killed him. They even crucified him. They didn't understand that by dying, Jesus was winning. They didn't understand that by being crucified, Jesus was conquering. But why? How can that be? It's all because of the cross. That's the wisdom of God. By this cross, he then gives us all that we need from God. Look at this. It's explained back to verse 30. He came, became to us the wisdom of God. And what do we receive in that wisdom? God's righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. But these are all gifts rooted to us in the wise cross. Let me show you this. The first thing we get of this wisdom is we get God's righteousness. So I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Let's turn back in your Bibles a couple pages to Romans chapter 3. This is the clearest explanation, I think, in the Bible about how we are given a righteous standing before God. But the reason it's given, and the only reason we get it, is because of the cross of Christ. So in Romans 3, if you're not familiar with the argument, Paul's just laying out everybody's guilty before God. And even when you want to say, yeah, they are guilty, aren't they? But not me, right, Paul? He's like, no, 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 not even one. No exclusions. Everybody's guilty. Everybody's condemned. And God's law really isn't a help. 
Because it's, it's not the way to get around this. this. God's law is not the way to get righteous. The law only exposes that you're not. shows you that you got a problem. It can give you a diagnosis, but it can't give you the medicine or the remedy. And so Paul's logic then, we need a way to get righteous before God, but we got to go around the law because nobody could keep it. The law only condemns. And that's where we start in verse 21 of Romans 3. He says, but now the righteousness of God, or righteous standing that comes from God, has been manifested apart from the law. Good, because we're all doomed before the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. They talked about it, but they weren't it. They weren't the answer themselves. So what's the answer? Verse 22, the righteousness of God or that comes from God is given through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So this is the answer. How can we be accepted and righteous before God? He has to give it to us. He has to give us his own righteousness so he, we, we can be accepted into his perfect heaven. You need God-like perfect righteousness credited to you such that you had lived it. But it comes to you as a gift. But see, here's the thing. That seems like very unjust. Why can I enjoy the fruits of of God's righteousness when I have been anything but righteous before God. That's unjust. God, are you just that unfair? Are you that unjust? Are you that bad of a judge? Two, that you would just wink at my sin and not care and just totally excuse it? No. And the solution to that, of course, you know where I'm going. It is the cross. Look at verse 25. He explains it for us. We've talked about this. This is that satisfaction of wrath. Jesus himself fulfills the justice of God as he dies for our sins. But how did that happen? He goes on, by his blood, which refers to what? The cross, right? The cross is where he becomes that propitiation. The cross is where the wrath of God is satisfied to the full. And what was this for? Paul goes on. This was to show God's righteousness. And this was important because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. That is, God was so patient, but it seems like he was just like an old grandfather up in heaven who's like, ah, tut, tut, it's okay, you sinned a whole bunch, I'll still love you. That's not how this works when God is the judge of truth. Seems like he could be patient for a while, but he still has to judge sin, which means all sinners in this room, which is everybody here, were doomed, unless there's a way this can get dealt with. And of course, that's the cross. For what happens at the cross, verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. Why? Because he really punished sin and did it to the full. He didn't wink at it. He didn't excuse it. He paid it all out. All his wrath for sin got poured out on that cross. And so then what can he can do? Well, if the penalty has been paid, he can then be the justifier the one who declares righteous, the one who has faith in Jesus. Why? Because we're righteous of ourselves? No, but because the cross of Christ gives us his righteousness. The cross is the answer. When your sin has all been paid for and justly paid for, brothers and sisters, you know what that means? There's nothing you have to pay. Never to be accused again. The cross of Christ settles the matter. That's the wisdom of the cross. The next gift he mentions that the cross gives us is sanctification from God. I'll just give you one verse this time. This is Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering, speaking of Jesus, of course, offering himself on the cross, by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time But then he adds, those who are being sanctified. You get this. Jesus' one sacrifice has eliminated our sin, but not only the guilt of it and the punishment, but our enslavement to it. The power of the cross has shackled us, unshackled us from the bondage of sin and its power that we can live a holy life now. We can put sin to death. But again, that's not earned by us. We didn't merit that. We got it because of the power of the cross. Furthermore, he mentions this third gift 
back to 1 Corinthians 1.30, but a redemption from God. And that maybe encapsulates all of it, being set free from sin's power and penalty together. Again, just a single verse. This is Ephesians 1.7. In Christ, we have redemption. But how? Through His blood. What is that talking about? The cross. And what is that redemption? The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. But how do you get that forgiveness? How do you get that grace? It can only come to you because of the justice and wisdom of the cross. Because you understand, to redeem something, we went through Exodus, right? That was a big redemption story. People were bought out from under slavery to be brought into relationship with God, but it was because a ransom price was paid, the blood of the Lamb. And it's through the blood of the Lamb of God that we are set free from sin. Christian, what do you have that didn't come to you because of the cross? Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, but what? On the cross. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Or another way to say it, Where would you be without the cross? And again, back to 1 Corinthians, this is all by design. To shame the world, humiliate the proud, take away all grounds for boasting in men, but to direct you to the one place where you can boast, and that's in Jesus Christ and his cross. So you understand, this is what defines us as the people of God. Look at verse 31 now, finally, of 1 Corinthians 1. What is this all for? To the glory and praise of God alone. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, and we're boasters, aren't we? We're braggarts. And that's okay if we boast in this. You boast in the Lord and in his cross. No other person, no ideal, no political position or political candidate or pastor or church practice should rally us like the cross. That must be our constant theme, our mantra, that we would say with Paul, I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. For it's that cross that draws us together to God, but binds us to one another. And all other Christians' concerns, that might be good things, homeschooling, family discipleship, Christian education, certain style of evangelism, foreign missions, focus on biblical counseling, a need for family outreach, the importance of small groups and one-to-one Bible reading. Again, all of those things, or some of them might be very, very good, but they cannot take the central place of Jesus Christ and His cross in this church. And so what will it look like in the church in other ways then? if we're going to stay united and stay centralized on Christ and His cross. Chiefly, it means we need to boast in our unity that the cross is purchased. Boasting in the cross means you need to boast in that Christ has made us one. And I have two implications for this. One, this means, as a church, you need to reach out to the stranger. You need to reach out to the stranger. And of course, that's true like in your life. Like we should be reaching out to others like Christ reached out for us, so to speak. But I just mean even here in the fellowship. You need to reach out to the stranger. Maybe it's even a familiar face, let alone, of course, visitors. But a familiar face, you should reach out to them. Maybe they're even a member. And you just don't know anything about them or how they're doing spiritually. Part of championing the unity we have at the cross is to touch base, to reach out, to greet, to share and swap stories about the cross. Now, we might be hesitant to do that. I mean, we all get in our groove, right? We sit in our same sections for the most part, pretty much. We sit with the same people. And we can be hesitant to reach out and connect. You know, maybe you're afraid. It's like, we don't have anything in common, I'm pretty sure, though I've never talked to them, you know? I wouldn't know what to say. Uh, Maybe they need something, and I don't know how I can help. Well, if we're coming here, especially the membership, and we're together, guess what we all have in common? 
Christ and his cross. Make that the connection point then. Retell one another how Christ has changed your life. Remind us of the glories of what the cross has done and his power in your life. Now, more than once uh, over my time at Grace, uh, I've reached out to men and say, hey, I don't even know you really. Let, let's read the Bible together. And typically that's gone on with guys that I just typically wouldn't hang out with, or they wouldn't want to hang out with me, frankly. And in a worldly sense, the world looks on and they just see, you guys have nothing in common. And yet we've enjoyed such great fellowship as we read the Bibles together. Why? Because we share the most important thing, a love for Christ. We've been humbled by the cross and we love our dear Savior. And when the world looks into a church made up of connections like that, which we see going on here, but what is it going to see? It's going to see a church that's, we're different. We reference different demographics. We're in different stages of life. We have different interests. It looks otherworldly, actually. Heavenly, even. For the cross is the only way we get there. All right. Here's the harder thing. When I say we might champion our unity by reaching out to the stranger, that's the easier one. Here's the hard one. You got to reconcile with the estranged. The cross demands that in us. So what does that look like? Are there folks that you've been avoiding in this church because of some rift with them? Like, let me just ask, why are you at second hour and not the earlier one? Now, there's all kinds of reasons. But is it because you know somebody usually goes to first hour and you don't want to be near them? I'm tired of dealing with this issue. I hope it's just going to go away. I'm going to go sit on the other side of the auditorium. The cross we profess and unite around is so much stronger than whatever that rift is. It paves the way. Because what are we gathering around, especially when you come to this table? We're, we're gathering as sinners. What, what are we offering? Nothing. What pride are we trying to hold on to or... or pride or outlook we're trying to defend about what people think about us. I'd rather come be seen as a fool who is a failure but has a great redeemer than a proud person resting on their own wisdom. That might mean you need to confess your sin. And then can we not forgive? Can we not show grace to those who don't deserve it? Because that's what we got. Because in the end, when we champion that kind of humility, that kind of unity that was won at the cross, peace is the way forward. That's why we hear this. This is Colossians 3, 13. He's commanding us about these things. He says, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, what are you supposed to do? Forgive each other. But it's not just period. What does he say after that? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. We're just giving other people grace, the kind of grace we already got. And how can we do that? Because we go back and we remember the cross. And how, how long do we have to do that till? Every day, as long as it's called today. Or you know this as we come to the, what we say in 1 Corinthians every time we come to this table. And we remind you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, you proclaim the cross until when? Until he comes back. Because guess what? You need the cross until he gets here. Let's thank him for that. Let's be a unified church around the cross. As I pray, let's have the men who have already been designated to come forward and distribute to us the elements. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, you are great in mercy. We thank you for the gift of Christ and his cross. Lord Jesus, we praise you. Forgive us for the rifts and divisions we've made in the church that you've bought. Help us to be humble. Help us to be teachable. Help us to be those that always point to you as most significant in our heart and in our life. And Spirit, uh, help us. Help us to walk in the unity that only the gospel has made. That the world would see that we are yours and there is grace found with Christ. In whose name alone we pray. Amen.